Eleven people are summoned to a mysterious place. None of them have any idea why they are there. The only thing in common between them is that they are all from a place called Tanir. A fairy suddenly appears out of nowhere and tells them to get ready for the fight. This leaves all of them confused, wondering what she is talking about. She introduces herself as Yesel, the fairy who runs this place. The confused crowd tries to get some answers about their situation, but she refuses to respond. Enraged by this, a mercenary pulls out his sword and threatens to kill her. She lets out a sigh, warning him to stop if he doesn't want to die, but the mercenary refuses to listen and attacks her. In the blink of an eye, he is killed. As if it were a game, a notification suddenly pops up about his death. Everyone is left shocked and scared for their own lives. Yesel with a wicked smile remarks that it was self-defense. The system once again gives a notification. It forms a party of five people from the group. The fairy refers to it as her master's work. She opens a space-time rift and tells the newly formed party to step in if they don't want to die. Suddenly, a person steps forward. He is Han Islet, a farmer. He tells her to have the master summon a weapon. He mentions that they are one-star heroes, so if they go without weapons, it would be a suicide mission. Everyone wonders what he is talking about. She asks the master to summon weapons using a keyboard. The master agrees and summons low-tier weapons for them. Han catches the attention of a girl named Jenna as he seems to know more than he is letting on. Following Han's lead, everyone rushes to equip themselves with different weapons. Everyone grabs the most dangerous-looking weapons but not Han. He grabs a wooden shield, the party enters the rift, and the system starts giving notifications of their deaths soon after. The party gets wiped out in no time. Yesel gets visibly angry and orders everyone else to enter the rift as well. Han seems to be the only one who is calm and ready to face whatever they are about to fight, while everyone else is scared and looking for a way to escape. Upon entering the rift, they are teleported to a battlefield. The system calls it the first floor and gives them the quest to eliminate all the enemies. Everyone gets terrified and tries to run away. The system registers this as being frightened and reduces their stats by 30%. Their attempt to escape leads nowhere as the group runs into an invisible wall, making it clear that their only option is to fight if they want to live. Apart from Han, Jen is the only one who seems to have her head in the game. The two quickly come up with a plan to defend themselves from the incoming attack by the goblins. Pick Me Up is a mobile game. Its objective is to clear a 100-floor tower by using heroes and equipping them with weapons. Just a day ago, Han was a normal human playing the game, his real name being Han Sojin. The game has heroes ranging from 1 star to 7 star. After playing for a while, Han runs into an in-game event. A dungeon that drops a rare item that can be used to create a 7 star hero. In Pick Me Up, once a hero dies, they are gone for good, even if they are a high level hero. So, Han uses a disposable party of 1 star heroes to raid the dungeon. This way he can scout the dungeon and learn the boss's attack patterns first. Han's party is easily wiped out by a level 999 boss. The boss has no name, making Han think it must be a system error. To his surprise, the boss looks directly at Han and then he is suddenly teleported inside the game. The game starts creating a new account by the name Watver. He spawns in a burning village. It is a tutorial for the new player. Han is suddenly attacked by a goblin. It doesn't take long for him to realize his situation. The tutorial continues as the game makes the player summon a new hero. A rare four-star hero named Shay is summoned. The player forms a party between Shay and Han before throwing them into a dungeon. Unlike Han, who is only one star, Shay is skilled at combat and instantly kills five goblins. A problem soon appears for Han as the tutorial continues. The next part of the tutorial is about synthesis, combining two heroes to make a more powerful one. This is also where he meets Yesel for the first time. Yesel is surprised to find out that Han is from Earth. Not knowing what to do, she just tells him to just go with the flow and continue playing the game. She forces him to go inside the synthesis tower. The synthesizing process begins. Any normal player would obviously sacrifice the lower rated hero to increase the stats of the higher level hero. Han is certain that he is going to die. To his surprise, the player misses inputs and kills Shay instead. At present, the goblins are unleashing their wrath upon the party, swiftly killing the terrified individuals in their path. 
Jenna and Han work together to eliminate them. Han, while fighting, ponders on the synthesizing process that uses drag and drop by the player. He finds himself lucky that he survived because of the master's mistake. All the monsters have been defeated except the last two, so he inquires about them from Jenna. Her response is interrupted as the last goblin bites off Han's arm. Despite being in pain, he contemplates on how he got summoned to this game, but he's sure about one thing. The master messed with the wrong guy. Jenna expresses concern, but Han assures her that he'll be fine when they return, reflecting on the reason for the popularity of this game, and that is observing the game like a god from above. Han asks the master if it's fun. Recounting how he was once a player who loved this game, he addresses Loki, the master of the master ranked fifth in the world, urging him to watch carefully as he survives until the end. Notifications pop up, announcing that the first floor has been cleared with Han as the MVP. Han is in a training ground, giving his all to get stronger. He reflects that he's inside Pick Me Up, and there are two ways for a hero to die in the game. One is to get synthesized, and the other is to die in combat. One-star heroes are basically useless in this game, so he's determined to get more powerful if he wants to have any chance of escaping. While continuing his training, he knows that he has to be mentally strong as well to be able to survive. He motivates himself by remembering that he survived even without his parents. However, his thoughts are interrupted when Jenna asks what he's doing. Despite his rude response, she reveals that she has decided what she needs to do to survive. Jenna then begins her own training, shooting with her bow, hitting the target precisely. Prompting Han to converse with her, he notices her beginner archery skill. Impressed by her status, Han reflects on her performance in their first combat yesterday. He declares that he'll help her so they can work together to escape. The system recognizes their partnership and creates a friendship bonus, granting them additional benefits when they are in a party together. Later, Han calls Yesel to ask her some questions. He queries if he is the only one who can see the system notification. Yesel has a bad poker face. Although she tries to dodge the question, Han can tell just from her clumsy reaction. He also wonders what will happen if the master quits the game as it has been a week since they played the game. It would be normal for someone to rage quit it after losing a 4-star hero who only has a 1% chance of being summoned. Han continues asking questions and every time he gets his answers just from her reaction. Han knows that he needs Tids to know the rules to adapt to this world. Upon being asked, he reveals everything to Jenna. They'll have to raid the 100th floor tower. If they reach the 100th floor then they should be able to escape, but ultimately their lives are in the master's hands. As he spent the day training he learned a fun rule, if he wants something like food or other necessities, they automatically appear in his drawer. He also understands the rules of getting stronger which didn't make sense before. Even if two heroes are one star their combat abilities are different due to training. It doesn't increase a hero's level or stats but it can give them new skills. Han realizes that there are three ways that heroes can be categorized. First is their mental strength, which refers to their ability to remain unafraid when facing enemies. Second is their skills. Higher level heroes are summoned with evident skills, while lower level heroes possess hidden skills that the master must uncover. Third is their physique, which can be enhanced through hard work. Three days have passed since Han began training and has gained two new skills. The master finally logs in and summons three new heroes named Yelson's Toady and Aaron. They are faced with the same confusion that Han initially had. They are out of weapons so the new heroes will have to go into battle with old iron swords, which is the default weapon. They form a party and go into the rift but the new heroes have the same frightened reaction, decreasing their stats. Han quickly realizes that they will be useless and he and Jenna will have to work together again if they want to clear this floor. This time they are attacked by wolves. He notices Jenna being scared and he approaches her, causing her to jump in shock. He instructs her to take care of two goblins. Han is relieved as her status shows that she's no longer scared. Due to his bad weapon, he faces some trouble killing the monsters, but he doesn't let that stop him. Han defends himself using his shield and uses the old iron sword to attack the wolves. He barely manages to defeat them. But he is not alone, as Jenna kills all the goblins using her bow. They manage to clear the first floor without any casualties. They return to their base, but to their horror, they are immediately being teleported to the third floor. It seems their master is being reckless. 
If they go to the third floor now, they will surely die as the newly summoned heroes are not ready for a fight. To Han's relief, the master logs out before they are teleported. Han deduces that the time in game is about three times slower than the time in the real world. This means that the master will log back in about three days, which is one day in the real world. Han realizes that a regular person summons as a one star in the game. If the person had a combat-oriented profession, then they would be summoned as a higher-level hero like the mercenary who was two star. Meanwhile, Jenna tries to make them understand the situation but they refuse to fight. But Han is not worried as he knows that if they continue to be useless and then the master will eventually synthesize them. He and Jenna continue their training but it only involves swinging a sword and Jenna firing her bow. The others continue to waste their time looking for an exit that doesn't exist. Han and Jenna gain new skills. He gets hit by an arrow in the leg, causing concern for Jenna. But he informs her that the laws of the real world are not the same here, as his wound gets healed. His old skills even get synthesized into a new skill. Finally, the day comes once again for them to fight. Yesel asks them to gather for the fight but the newcomers refuse, prompting her to give them a beating. Finally, they raid the third floor but it's all too easy for them this time. The others continue to not participate but once again Han is not worried as he doesn't have to share EXP with them. In a new twist of events, the master gets the option to spin the Wheel of Fortune to improve the behaviors of the disobedient heroes. The master chooses the first floor for the challenge which is no problem for Jenna and Han. The three heroes continue to hide behind Han and Jenna while they clear the floor and get more and more rewards. After challenging the floor many times, the master returns them to the base. But as Han predicted, the master starts synthesizing. Even though the player doesn't play an active role during the fight, the master has been observing them. Since Han and Jenna do all the work, the master adds them to his favorites. First, the master chooses Jenna and Yelsons to enter the synthesizing room. Though Jenna is scared, Han assures her that she will be fine. Yelsons gets angry yelling that it's unfair as he didn't choose any of this. It's no use as the synthesizing process starts. Yelsons turns into light and disappears while Jenna levels up and gets a new skill called Hawkeye. She comes out confused about what happened. Next, Han and Toby are chosen. Han calmly walks in while Toby foolishly holds on to the hope that he might get sent home. This time Toby disappears while Han levels up and gains composure skill. Watching the events unfold, Aran realizes how foolish she had been. Jenna also gets scared thinking that she might also get synthesized in the future. Han tries to comfort her and tells her to follow her father's advice to get close to someone strong if she wants to survive. The next day Jenna bails to Han, revealing that she chose the only person she knows, Han. Even Aran decides to come to Han. He tells him that he realizes how foolish he has been and asks Han to help him get stronger. Han gives him a spear to train him. This way their party will have all three basic character types. Han as a close-range fighter Jenna for the long range, and finally Aran for the mid-range. Han is not a nice teacher though. He attacks Aran immediately telling him that he has to learn everything himself as Han did. Having never fought in a real fight, Aran gets easily defeated by Han. He tells Aaron that if he gives up so easily then he'll get killed. Later, the master unlocks the forge. Having unlocked free room, Han goes to check it out. He calls Yesel once again. He asks her if she is the one sending the tips to the players, telling them to do things like build a forge. He also confirms with Yesel if she can surf the web. She tells him that she can. Han realizes that the tips she sends are being used as a base for newer players. Loki is a pick-me-up player who posts tips on the game's website. He is the number one player in the game and also Yesel's favorite. With a bright smile, she goes on about praising Loki. But to her surprise, Han nonchalantly reveals that he is Loki. At first, Yesel refuses to believe but Han has proof. He tells her his account number which is only known to the player for security reasons. She insistently becomes a fangirl asking for Han's autograph. Yesel is worried about what is going to happen to Nifleim without Loki. It was Han's waiting room as a player, the base where all the heroes stay. His waiting room was around level 18 to 22 with 13 floors and a capacity of 20,000 people. Han tells her that if she is so worried about it then she should just send him back. But she can't do that. Now that Yesel knows that Han is Loki she is more than willing to answer all his questions. 
she confirms that all the heroes that the players use are real people and not AI. The players themselves are unaware of this fact. Next, he asks her if he can return home if he clears the tower, but she doesn't know. Han's next question is probably the most important one, who brought him here? Unfortunately for Han, she doesn't know. He realizes that if each player has their own waiting room then the 100 million players around the world each have their own world inside the game. He tells Yesel that if she wants to climb the tower then she should follow his instructions, something she is more than happy to do. Elsewhere, Jenna and Aaron continue their training. She is growing quickly, having also mastered a dagger while Aaron is struggling. Han meets up with Jenna along with Yesel. Together they go to the warehouse. Yesel opens the warehouse for Han. He grabs a bunch of raw materials that he can use to craft a weapon. After speaking with Yesel, Han realizes that he exists as half-master and half-hero in this world, so he can invade another hero's territory. This means that he can access the forge, which a normal hero won't be able to do. He tries to forge a weapon, but due to not having the skills for it, he incurs a triple penalty. A player has to play a mini-game to create a weapon. The better their score, the better the weapon that will be forged. Despite having a triple penalty, Han chooses the hardest possible difficulty. He is indeed the top player as he easily completes the game and creates a C-ranked sword. Han further creates a bow, a spear, and a shield, but due to the rarity of the materials, they all turn out to be c rank. He decides to stop there as he doesn't want the master to come back only to find a bunch of materials missing from his inventory. Using their new weapons, the party becomes much more efficient in combat. They try to clear the fourth floor while working together as a group. As this is Aaron's first real combat, he still gets frightened. Jenna helps him pull himself together by slapping him. This might be Aaron's last chance because if he continues to underperform then the master might synthesize him. They manage to clear the floor. But Aaron is still worried about what will happen to him. To his delight, the master places him under his favorites. Jenna jokingly mentions herself and Aaron as being Han's underlings. This makes Han remember his own heroes. His number one underling was a hero named Cyrus, the submaster of his waiting room, and Yerna, his number two underling. They were so intelligent that it made Han wonder if they were really just AI. But now he knows that they were real people. Elsewhere in Niflheim, Cyrus is preparing to leave for an investigation about her master's whereabouts. While in Han's world, the master starts upgrading his waiting room. Han realizes that they must be an office worker since they can splurge so much on a game. In Pick Me Up, you don't get any gems by clearing floors and there is rarely an in-game event, so players must use real money to upgrade their waiting room. Due to the upgrade to the residence, the master can now house more heroes. So, he decides to do another summoning. They summon three new heroes and Yesel insistently starts asking them if they can do jobs like cooking or forging. Due to the upgrades, the system within the waiting room has now changed. Now one can be a non-combatant if they work a job. Those who don't have any of these skills must fight in the dungeons. The master forms a new party of the summoned heroes. They are all level one, so the master is sending them to the first floor to weed out the weak ones. Immediately, two of the heroes who go through the rift die. This scares the other heroes who are set to go next. Aaron decides to help them and asks Yesel to put her in the party. As Aaron lacks fighting experience, Han believes it to be a good idea and asks Yesel to recommend him to the master using a tip. Because of Aaron's help, the next party manages to clear the floor without any casualties. The survivors all return to the residence, Due to the upgrade, the group can now have more stuff to eat other than just potatoes. Not wanting to fight, one of the new heroes, Dolph, pretends to be a chef, but his non-existent skills become clear when he fails to make anything out of the ingredients. Han insistently changes their cook and assigns the position to a hero named Chloe. Unlike Dolph, Chloe whips up a great meal using potatoes. Han tells the group that they must instruct the new heroes from now on. Han assigns another hero named Anak the job of being a carpenter. He warns the new group that though the non-combatants have higher survivability, they might get replaced if a new, more skilled hero shows up. Out of all the new heroes, only three show up to train, a group of teenagers who call Han their boss. Since Han is at a much higher level than them, it's like an adult fighting a child. Jenna also continues to grow. She levels up her bow skills to 5 and also acquires sword skills of level 2.
Aaron, on the other hand, continues to struggle. Though he trains the most out of anyone, his spear skills refuse to go beyond level 2. A few days later, the master summons 10 more heroes. Now, Han doesn't have to do anything as Aaron and the teenagers do all the instructing. Their population continues to grow with only one casualty during the wedding. Jenna starts to wonder why the master hasn't challenged the fifth floor in so long, but Han knows the answer. It's because the difficulty level of the fifth floor is much higher. In Pick Me Up, every five floors the difficulty ramps up. It's like a boss floor, prompting Han to wonder if he will be able to survive the fifth floor. The new party learns to work together. The weaker heroes have their own way of fighting through formation. Though Han can clear the floor all by himself, he knows the importance of training others as there will be challenges. He can't complete by himself. In the new summon, the master obtained a tanner and a blacksmith, and he also activated the equipment workshop. The tanner, carpenter, and blacksmith all work together to make equipment. They mostly make E-rank equipment which is given to the new summons. The main party of Han, Jenna, and Aaron get the higher level gear. As usual, some of the new summons didn't train and tried to look for the exit. They quickly got synthesized. Finally, the day comes when the master challenges the fifth floor. The party consists of Han, Jenna, Aaron, and two of the teenagers, Zid and Hansen. After going through, they arrive at an abandoned city. Unlike usual, there are no monsters around. Han orders Jenna to climb a nearby bell tower to get a better view. To her horror, there are thousands of goblins entering the city. This is not the usual subjugation quest, it is a survival quest. They must survive the goblin onslaught for 10 minutes which equals 30 minutes on the floor, as the time here is the same as Earth's time. The survival quests are no problem at a higher level but on the lower floors, it is considered a hero grinder. They have a very low success rate of just 9% on the lower floors. Han quickly leads the group to a narrow alleyway where they have a higher chance of survival. He organizes the group, assigning each of them a specific task, and tells Zid and Hansen to form a barricade. But the goblins arrive before they can do so. The onslaught starts as waves of goblins start attacking them. They strike like rabid animals hungry for their blood. Han assumes control, directing the group. He begins to feel the burn of exhaustion. Meanwhile, Zid and Hansen seem to run short of energy. Due to their low level and fewer skills, they use more movement than necessary, exhausting their stamina quickly. Though the monsters are low-level goblins from the first floor, due to their sheer numbers, they are starting to become a problem. The goblins charge blindly without any fear of death. Han continues to order Zid and Hansen to switch so they can continue to fight without draining their stamina completely. Even Jenna joins the action, shooting the goblins with arrows to stop them from infiltrating the barricade. Tragedy strikes as Zid gets injured. One of the goblins manages to cut off his hand. Han remains stoic and orders Hansen to switch with him. Hansen begins to hesitate even though Han tells him that Zid's hand will be healed once they return. Zid becomes frightened, prompting Han to quickly step in himself to defend the barrier. While Jenna helps Zid stop the bleeding, Han continues to hold off the goblin. Their equipment starts to wear down as Hansen's sword stops working, making Zid switch with him. Desperate times call for desperate measures. So Han ordered Jenna to fire all of her remaining arrows because if the goblins breach the barricade, they are as good as dead. Suddenly, one of the goblins manages to stab the already weakened Zid. He collapses to the ground as the system notifies him that he has fallen into a dying state. Their already dire situation takes a turn for the worst as Zid lies on the ground in critical condition. Jenna is worried about him but doesn't know what to do. Hansen also starts to struggle due to the absence of Zid, having no one to switch with. Meanwhile, Han is dealing with hordes of goblins. Realizing Zid is dead, he takes over for Hansen and tells Jenna to help him instead of thinking about Zid. Continuously dealing with the horde, their skills level up as their souls awaken. Han finds it meaningless as awakening is of no use to them dead. Hansen surrounded by goblins screams for Han's help but he is unable to. As Hansen gets killed, he tells Jenna and Aaron to stick by him as they have no time to grieve. Running from the goblins, they come across a wall stopping their path. Han immediately orders Jenna to climb the wall as he slashes multiple goblins. After she is up, he tells Aaron to go next. While Jenna is helping him up, a goblin is able to stab Aaron's leg. As they don't have time, Han immediately cuts off his leg. 
causing him to scream in agony. Meanwhile, the goblins start to step on each other to climb the wall. Han quickly gets over the wall and instructs Jenna to fend them off using Aaron's spear. While trying to keep them from getting up, Jenna loses the spear. Having no choice, Han uses his leg to keep them down, instructing Jenna to do the same. With only 30 seconds left, a goblin manages to grab Han, pulling him down. He continues to fight but gets stabbed by one of them. He winces and screams with pain as the goblin pulls out the sword. With both him and Jenna bleeding, Han is sure it's over. As he wonders if he will die on only the fifth floor, he remembers everything he went through. Anger surges through his body as he refuses to let it end like this. His eyes change color, and he once again starts killing the goblins with his newly awakened skill, Berserk. Every part of Han's body is in pain, but he refuses to fall. Continuously slashing the goblins one after the other, his sword eventually breaks, yet he refuses to stop. One of the goblins' claws is heading straight for Han. Just then, the time runs out and everything stops, saving the lives of Han, Jenna, and Aaron. With Han as the MVP, the stage is cleared, and all three of them are returned to the gate. They are all in disbelief as Jenna cries tears of joy. As she asks Han to help her up, she wonders if they actually survived and if this is how the floors will be from now on. Han responds that their timing was unlucky as their team was not strong enough, especially Hansen and Zid. Otherwise, survival missions are not that difficult. Jenna is aware of this but still feels regretful. Upon being welcomed to the waiting room, they are asked about Hansen and Zid, and Han responds that they died, leaving everyone in disbelief. Upon returning to his room, he immediately drops down on the bed. Thinking back to everything that transpired, Han isn't bothered by the deaths, as that is a common occurrence in this game. He also remembers gaining the Berserk skill, which doesn't add up since he also has the Composure skill. Considering the fact that these skills can't coexist, he is certain it's a bug. Although he isn't sure, he believes it might be because he is half master and half hero. Being tired, he decides to stop thinking as he needs rest for the busy day ahead. The next morning, Jenna is already training when he arrives, although she usually arrives after him. Upon asking her, he finds out that she just doesn't want to die by staying weak. Looking at Jenna's growth, Han knows she is talented as well as hardworking. But that's not the case for Aaron, who despite his hard work, hasn't been able to acquire any new skills. Han continues his training as he is close to reaching the max level and expects to be promoted to level 2 soon. But something is bothering him, and it's none other than Jenna, who is admiring his abs. After punishing her, Han gets up, and Jenna asks him why Aaron isn't here when he usually trains hard. He tells her to leave him be, as he must be having a hard time since he used to train hard with Hansen and Zid. Unlike the guys here, who just pretend to train when the master logs in due to the fear of being synthesized, Han tells Jenna that those guys should have died instead of them. Suddenly, Aaron shows up with a frustrated look on his face, expressing that if only he were stronger, they wouldn't have died. Han responds that they simply died because they were weak. Having already spent a month in the game, Han observed that the waiting room time is three times slower than on Earth, meaning ten days in the real world is a month in the game. However, this is not the case in battle stages, as time flows the same as on Earth. Suddenly, Yesel shows up, bragging about Han being the master of masters for clearing the level 5 dungeon with a poor team. Jenin inquires why she is acting like that, but Han keeps it a secret while trying not to be bothered by Yesel. The master forms a new party consisting of Jenna, Han, Owen, Lewis, and Joffrey, and they are instructed to enter the space-time rift. This time, the party will be entering the daily dungeon. One of the new party members, Owen, asks Han if he will be fighting with them as he isn't strong enough. Han tells him not to worry, as they won't have to fight. Upon entering the rift, they are transported to Kendrick Forest. This time, it's just a collection quest that varies in location depending on the day. Jenna is on edge as only Han knows this info, so he calms her down and explains to everyone how to collect stuff and store it in the rift, referring to it as the trash bin. Everyone, including Jenna, is delighted but he tells Jenna she needs to hunt. Although not as relaxing as collecting branches, she is still very happy upon spotting meat. Like everything else, she is pretty talented in hunting and butchering, as she saw her father do it. With a little over 30 minutes left, Han goes to look for something. 
he finds the rare monster he was looking for, the Queen of the Forest, as she possesses a low rank promotion stone. In one swift moment, Han beheads the males that were with her. Finally, face to face with the queen, he taunts her to bring it on. Back at the base, the newbies are scared after seeing a monster, but on closer inspection, they realize it is just Han, carrying the queen deer's head. As he is tired, he leaves the rest to Jenna, who has hunted enough for everyone to eat. While dismembering the head, she unlocks a new skill, Hunter of the Forest, and Han is able to acquire a D-rank Wend Elemental Stone. Back at the base, everyone is thrilled to finally enjoy some meat. After they have eaten, Han tells Jenna to follow him. He takes her to the daily dungeon, as they change depending on the day of the week. He forms a temporary party with Jenna as they enter the Sinmural Plateau. Han wants to gather elemental stones and materials so they can become stronger. Jenna is marveled by the view while Han looks around and spots plant life, which are key ingredients for healing potions. He decides to go for them later as they are here for another purpose, slaying the boss monster, which proves to be quite easy, and Han obtains another elemental stone. As Jenna dissects the rest of the wolf, she expresses how peaceful it is and wishes they only had to do this to survive. Han agrees that it would be a paradise if only there wasn't a master, immediately realizing he himself was one. As Jenna wishes for the master to never come back, he wonders if the Nefelheimer people also think the same. Regardless, he tells Jenna that she could do other things as fighting isn't everything. When she asks him why he isn't following that path, Han simply offers a grin as his only reply. A few days later, they enter the sixth floor with the usual party, the only addition being Dika. The sixth floor is an uncommon exploration mission. Han informs everyone to keep their voices low and head down, misinterpreting, they all drop to the ground. Han lets them know that they just need to satisfy the requirement to clear the stage, which is to just investigate their surroundings. Upon investigation, they spot three goblins with a blowing horn. From a tree, Jenna spots a goblin village with about 100 goblins. Knowing it's a trap, Han decides to deal with these three goblins first so they can alert the village. The plan is simple. Jenna will shoot one, while Han charges with Aaron following behind, and Dika stays for backup. With the plan in motion, Jenna shoots, taking out the first goblin. Aaron uses his spear, smashing the other one, and finally, Han finishes the last one off with a swift slash. The stage is cleared and Han is the MVP. The teleportation starts, but Han suddenly dashes off, quickly getting to the goblin village in order to observe the size. Before he gets spotted, they are all teleported back. Upon being asked where he went, he simply replies he was just looking around, but in reality, Han thinks that it might be a linked quest, which is also known as streams, and they start with this sort of exploration mission. He is frustrated as being able to analyze streams depends on how competent the master is, but he can't be sure if whatever saw the village through him. As he ponders why streaming has begun so soon, one of the residents tells him that some strange people showed up. This is a common occurrence, but Chlo expresses they have weapons and seem a little different. Han expected this as he knew exactly what she meant. The master has summoned high-rank heroes, the pulverizing wolves mercenaries. Han asks Yesel to confirm if the master spent any money. Her response confirms that the master has indeed summoned high-rank heroes, which he should have done before challenging the fifth floor. Nonetheless, he tells Chloe to go back to her job, as nothing changes even if a few special newbies have shown up. On their way back, they spot one of the new summons. Jenna immediately rushes to get to know her, while also introducing Han in the process. He immediately notices her class and abilities, and they are up to the mark of a three-star hero. He confirms her name is Edis and asks to talk to her. As they sit at a table, he confirms how much she knows being a three-star. She is aware that she was summoned to fight and other mechanics, confirming that the information each hero has depends on their rank. Han notices that even among the mercenaries, she is pretty skilled. Their conversation is interrupted as the master calls the new heroes to the plaza. We see another one of them coming out of the kitchen. Toy reports that he took off with a whole drumstick which could have fed five people if used in cooking. Han and Jenna also go to the plaza. The master forms a party named Pulverizing Wolves consisting of the newly summoned heroes. The old residents seem to be worried about the new arrivals. Thus, they complain to Han that they look evil and ask for his protection. 
Han responds with a smile if they expect him to help for free, as all they did was eat and pretend to train so they wouldn't get synthesized. With all that said, his face turns grim as he tells them to get lost before he gets enraged. As they leave, Aaron feels a bit bad for them, but Han tells him there is no need to pity people who were eating and resting while he had his leg cut off. Suddenly, Dika shows up all bruised, and we find out it was because of spurring with Aaron. Han tells them all to go rest, but Jenna stays. In the meantime, the party returns easily, clearing the floor. Seeing Han sitting, the leader of the party asks him about his identity. Han rudely replies it's none of his business. The mercenaries don't take well to Jenna and Han's attitude. The leader of the pulverizing wolves, Avanta Jax, once again, asked Han his name, but this time introducing himself first. He is curious if Han was also a mercenary, but upon hearing that he was a farmer, his gaze changes. Their conversation is cut short as the master summons ten more people while simultaneously starting the synthesis process. Three of the new summons are instructed to enter. Upon refusal, the mercenary grabs them as he starts dragging them to the synthesis building. Jenna is shocked as they aren't even getting a chance to prove themselves. She feels that it's wrong and the master is making a mistake which isn't far from the truth. As a master like Han knows, even one-star heroes can be talented, though rare. Jacken steps out feeling a lot stronger, and it's time for the next sacrifices as they beg to be saved. While the other mercenaries try to stop the sacrifices from running, Avant notices Edis just standing there as she does not want to take part in this. While this is going on, Han tells Yesel to tip the master that he won't know the usefulness of one-star heroes unless he uses them. Yesel follows, but the mercenaries aren't happy about this. Jacken tries to attack Han, but is stopped by Jenna's arrow. Seeing this, Avant gets angry and he asks Han if they know who they are. Han calmly replies with a grin that they are trash, causing a hostile relationship to be formed with the mercenaries except for Edis. Yesel tries to interfere, but Han has other plans as he continues to mock them, finally telling Yesel to initiate a duel with Avant. Avant finds him to be completely mad, but when Han offers that the winner can consume the loser, Avant readily accepts the duel with a smile. The master declines the duel initially as he is scared, but as Han shows his confidence, he yields, approving the duel. They both agree to stop the duel once the other party surrenders, as they won't get their synthesizing material otherwise. While Han is telling Yesel not to let anyone interfere, Avant rushes in, calling Han a fool for not even drawing his weapon. Though Avant is strong and has some good skills, he is still no match for Han as he uses his berserk skill. In the blink of an eye, Han appears behind him, smashing his face into the ground. But he isn't done just yet, as he draws his sword, thrusting it into Avant's arm. Han tells him to surrender, but as he tries to, Han moves the sword, causing Avant to scream in pain. Seeing this, his fellow mercenaries try to interfere, telling Han to leave Avant alone as he has already lost. However, Han has no intention of stopping, as they were going to kill the new summons when they had a chance. Moreover, he tells them that Avant just needs to surrender, which he can't, as Han is keeping his prey quiet with his hand on his mouth. The conversation continues, and Edis confesses they used to be mercenaries, but now they are just a thief troop. He asks her why she is with them, and offers her to join his side. She is a bit hesitant as her fellow mercenaries retaliate. So, in order to give her a push, Han stabs Avan's hand, telling her this is the end of trash, referring to the pulverizing wolves. This is enough for her to make up her mind, and she leaves the party, joining Han. The mercenary's anger reaches its peak as Han tells them to get lost. They jump to attack him, and Yesel tries to stop them as the duel hasn't finished. They disregard her warning, thus spelling their own demise. Yesel makes quick work of them, as Han finally lets Avon surrender. With the synthesizing process in progress, the master tries to stop it by rapidly tapping his screen, but what's done is done. Han's level reaches max as he gains new skills, and the master is tipped to promote him. Meanwhile, Yesel is worried the master might quit as he didn't even get to properly use his three-star heroes. Han understands the master might be fuming but is very well aware of his worth and he knows the master doesn't possess the courage to synthesize his best hero. As soon as he enters the cavern, everyone is gathered there, singing his praise. He immediately knows that it was Jenna who told everyone despite him telling her not to. 
The people continue to thank him for saving them, but Han clarifies that he only saved the newbies. He adds that the master seems very angry as six of them are called to the plaza. They try to stay calm, believing that they only need to hunt goblins, but Jenna already knows that's not the case. Han breaks their delusion by spelling it out. As they panic, one of them expresses that it's not true as they did their best. Han quickly solves their misunderstanding. He asks Dika and Aaron if these people truly did their best, to which both of them have no answer. So he asks Jenna, and she responds that they helped her carry stuff. In the end, the conclusion is their lives are worth no more than livestock. Hearing that, someone still tries to talk back, so Han quickly shuts him up. Their screams have no meaning as they get synthesized and become leveling material for Edis, as she alone steps out of the synthesis building. Han warns the new summons to work hard and prove their usefulness if they want to survive. Many of them, scared, believe they will die as they can't fight, but Han tells them that there are other options. He instructs people with other skills to teach anyone their techniques if they want to learn. Moreover, he offers to train anyone who wants to learn to fight. Lastly, he tells them they can go to Jenna for hunting and learn carpentry from Enoch. As Han finishes his Survival 101 class, the master logs out. Jenna is surprised to see him being this friendly, which isn't far from the truth, as Han did help them enough so they wouldn't die meaninglessly. With the 10th floor approaching, Han knows it's crucial that they have a strong second party comparable to the main one. The next morning, Han is offered bread made by a new summon and is pleased to see they are adjusting well. Moving on to more important matters, he tells Edis to follow him to the training center. There, he tells Jenna to spar with Edis using a dagger, although she is only good with bows. The match begins, and Jenna rushes in. Edis is shocked at how skilled she is, despite being so young. But little does she know, it has nothing to do with age as she loses soon after. She wonders if Jenna and Han were mercenaries, witnessing their strength. Jenna tells her she was just a weak hunter before coming here, and only got stronger by training hard. Han expresses to Edis that she can easily catch up with them by training, as she is a three-star and has more potential. Aaron, who is training, doesn't agree with this. However, it doesn't matter to Edis who Han was, as she has witnessed his strength and expresses that she will remember his advice. Following the mass synthesis yesterday, now, Han notices a lot more people training, but it's still not enough as there are not that many slots for the supporters' roles. As he looks around, he spots an interesting newbie. He goes up and asks him his name. He introduces himself as Usher Roderick, adding that he was deeply moved by Han's words yesterday. Han praises his good posture and asks what he used to do before coming here. Usher replies that he was a porter for the mercenaries and wanted to become one. Han grins and offers to spar with him to see his potential. That same evening, the master weeded out some newbies by synthesis. Despite Aaron's hard work, he wasn't the one to level up, as Usher was chosen instead, thus becoming level 3. The other people were sent to daily dungeons as usual. The next day, Han called a select few out. As Jenna complains, Han asked if anyone knows why they were called. Everyone is clueless except Dika, who answers it's to decide party members. Jenna questions this, saying that's the master's job, but Han can make suggestions that are rarely overlooked. The members are to be decided by lots and will be split into two parties. Han will be the first party leader, and Edis will be the second party leader. She suggests that Jenna will be better suited for the job, but Han replies she can't do it, prompting Jenna to scream at him. Edis wonders why they have to split, to which Han replies with a detailed explanation. Firstly, it is so the gap between the party members isn't too big as what happened on the fifth floor. Secondly, the number of people needed for a mission will increase going forward, needing from 10 to even hundreds of heroes. Lastly, if the main party gets annihilated, there should be a backup. With the explanation out of the way, it's time to draw lots, red indicating Han's team and blue meaning Edis's team. Both Jenna and Aaron get red and are very satisfied with the result, unlike Usher and Dika. Edis knows that she needs time to get their trust, but for now, the teams are decided. Han tells her not to get left behind, and she replies that she won't, especially after seeing yesterday's synthesis. With the party suggested to the master, it's time for the seventh floor, which is an easy subjugation of 13 goblins. Aaron is relieved to see this as it won't be a challenge. 
Han tells them to observe him as he goes into berserk mode. In a matter of seconds, he slaughters them all, leaving one behind. Jenna asked if he wants her to finish it up, but it being a linked quest, Han tells her to leave it alone as they need to explore. After taking note of three things, the rain, the flowing river, and a possibly collapsed dam, they clear the stage. Upon their return, they all have different plans. As Aaron is about to go to the training facility, suddenly Han stops him. This is because the master just purchased another pack. Realizing the situation, Han tells Jenna to bring the lots from his room and Aaron to bring Edis. This is because the master is summoning high-rank heroes. Han was already expecting this, as he used to be a master, and knows how some people who purchase once can't stop. This is because Pick Me Up has many things to keep the player hooked. It is a game where there is a lot to enjoy, like the fun of observing heroes, supporting them, giving orders, PvP, and much more. All this content only increases as the player climbs the tower, and who wouldn't enjoy being a god? With a few clicks, the new summons are here. One is a girl named Eloka, and the other is an old man named Roderick. As they wonder about the people they see, Eloka trips on her dress and falls in front of Han. Possibly the worst person to fall in front of as he doesn't plan on helping her up. Edis tells him she is an aristocrat, judging by the dress the girl is wearing. Upon inquiring, Han learns that Roderick knows the basics like summon and synthesis, but isn't aware of the concept of levels and skills. Moreover, everything else is normal except his high sense of duty which he describes as feeling hypnotized. Moving on, Han tells Jenna to bring the lot so he and Edis can decide who they will get on their team. They initially both want blue which is for Roderick. As Jenna brings the lot, Han is able to get a peek but wonders if Edis was also able to see. As the cup is placed on the ground, they both jump to grab the blue lot. However, witnessing fire magic, they quickly change their decision as they fight over the red lot. Who would have guessed the aristocrat is a magician, and they both want her. We learn that magicians can only be gotten from the gacha, unlike thieves and warriors who can be raised from one star, thus making them rare. Eloka still doesn't get what's going on, as Jenna tells them both to do it again since they cheated. When Roderick tells her to try thinking, she takes a second and finally realizes the situation, which both of them find repulsive. This time both of them draw the lots fairly without any grudges, and as luck would have it, Han got the magician girl, leaving Edis with Roderick. With new summons, it's once again time for synthesis, and people who couldn't get a supporter role are up on the chopping block. With synthesis done, Eloka steps out, and Han tells her this is what happens to those who fall behind. Next is Roderick's turn, after which it's straight to the rift for testing. Edis' party is called, and they enter the rift. While they are gone, Han asks Eloka what magic she can use, but she answers with a question. So Han this time asks her if she hates fighting, as that is why she was brought here. Eloka finds the situation unpleasant as she doesn't want to fight some unknown enemy without any reason. Hearing this, Han reminds her that she will become just like the people she consumed if she doesn't fight, which is a good enough reason as any. So once again, he questions what magic she can use. Finally, Eloka responds that the highest magic she can cast is third circle fire magic. Han already knows this and inquires if she can use any support magic. She proudly states that support magic is beneath her, a sure enough sign for Han that she can't use it. She lets Han know that nothing can compare to her fire magic. Though Han finds it unfortunate that she can't use support magic, she is still a mage. Edis's party returns and Roderick seems to have performed better than she expected. Now it's Han's team's turn to enter the rift, as stage 8 should be locked. Han assumes that they will probably go to the fourth floor, which should be perfect to test Eloka. He lets her know that she will be clearing floor 4 alone, startling her. However, when he taunts her, asking if she isn't confident like before, Eloka tells him he will be surprised. She isn't wrong as the master is sending them to the eighth floor. Everyone quickly readies themselves while Eloka is confused. Han wonders if the master is angry about last time or just finds the fourth floor boring. He doesn't have time for this as he tells everyone to dodge. Eloka is still clueless as an arrow heads straight for her. Han quickly rushes and saves her in time. Their mission is the subjugation of goblins, the same ones they saw during the exploration mission. Han tells Jenna to shoot her arrows and tells Aaron to attack the side as soon as the goblins rush them. 
As he is about to tell Aloka her role, the goblins begin their attack. While he fends them off, diverting their attention, he signals Aaron to attack. Simultaneously, he tells Aloka to cast, but she exclaims she needs one minute. She begins chanting while Han and the others focus on protecting her. However, the goblins seem to be targeting her. Han can't stop them all, so he asks Aloka for shield magic, only to find out she is unable to do anything while she chants. No matter how many he takes out, their struggle continues, as the monsters persistently keep coming. Seeing Aloka surrounded by monsters, Han realizes she can't even use mobile casting and is completely defenseless. In the nick of time, he grabs her and decides they need to change locations. He tells everyone that they are going to the forest and instructs Eloka to start casting as soon as they enter. As she complains, they are just about to reach the forest. Upon arrival, Han kicks her towards the forest. As she once again complains about the mistreatment, Han tells her no one will be able to treat her badly if she dies. He makes his stand just outside the forest and uses his berserk form for the second time. Although it is draining, Han realizes he needs to buy time. The monsters are annoying to say the least as they use their mobility to employ a hit-and-run strategy against Han. However, he uses his speed to get rid of their mobility. Doing this causes him to get attacked from behind, as his berserk state runs out due to a lack of stamina. Han is about to get attacked when a spear comes out of nowhere, piercing the monster. Aaron's help allows Han to once again get his footing but he tells him to stay put. As he lures the monsters, he wonders how long is left for the spell. Hearing that the spell is ready, he quickly cuts the ones following him while making his way to safety. With all of them gathered right in front of her, Aloka casts the spell Ignite. The flames start to consume the monsters, leaving even Han impressed. Witnessing magic for the first time, both Aaron and Jenna are amazed, but the job isn't finished. Han gets up as there are still some monsters who survived. Although he is tired and lacks energy, Han relies on his skill to deal with the remaining mob. Jenna and Aaron are quick to help him as they know he is tired. Han smiles, seeing how far they have come. Jenna jumps in with her daggers to thin down the mob. Meanwhile, Eloka is once again casting, meaning she is defenseless. Noticing this, Jenna takes care of the wolf approaching her. Eloka is almost done with the spell. Seeing that Aaron and Han are in their way, Jenna yells, telling them there is still time. Hearing this, they run as fast as they can. Finally, Aloka casts the spell, releasing an immense amount of firepower. Both of them barely manage to get out of range as the field gets engulfed. Han wonders if it's over, but it's not as some monsters are still alive. However, Aloka isn't done with her magic as there is another level to it. The flames turn into a tornado, pulling everyone towards it, even her allies. At last, as the flames settle, Han is shocked to see a huge crater with not even the ashes of the monsters remaining. The stage is cleared with Eloka as the MVP. Back from the floor, everyone is amazed and Jenna praises her. This gets to Eloka's head and she starts bragging about being the witch of Count Rivel's spirit. However, this is short-lived as she collapses from exhaustion. Han knows that she has many issues, but even he rarely saw a mage like her when he was the master. He defines her as a tank with no armor, meaning she only has firepower, but he doesn't mind that. As they grab her and head back, Han realizes that his time at the center might be ending soon. The next day, the master builds new facilities, including a magic research lab, an alchemy lab, and a library. These three buildings together form a new facility called the Magic Hall. Meanwhile, Han is making her train. As she complains, he tells her to just eat potatoes if she doesn't want to train. He tells her to run faster as she needs to build stamina to survive on the battlefield. As they run, he comments that her dress is much better than what she usually wears. She responds that it's custom-made magic clothing from her family that increases fire magic strength. While Aloka struggles, Han tells her that this is nothing compared to the training he does every day. Once again, he tries to push her with the potato dinner threat. Han considers themselves lucky for getting a mage, especially when the 10th floor is so close. Moreover, with the magic hall built, they can finally put materials they gathered from the two weekday dungeons to use. As he leaves the training ground, he tells Jenna to keep an eye on Eloka. Although potion crafting requires high-ranking pharmacists or alchemists, it can alternatively be done with minigames without any skill. Han visits the magic hall, 
There he tries to read a book, but is unable to. So, he starts making potions, for which he needs to play a rhythm minigame. Being a top-level player, he is pretty good at it, and is able to craft low-level potions. He worries that the master might find it suspicious but considers it better than dying. After this, he meets with Aaron and Jenna, and tells them they finally have a mage joining their party. They look confused as they already know this. He tells them to look carefully as he puts his hand in the brazier, shocking them both. He explains that they need to get used to this as Eloka is a fire mage. Both of them are horrified as hand counts while this hand gets burned. He takes out the burned hand after 10 seconds, and it is instantly healed due to them being in the lobby, but that doesn't mean they won't feel the horrible pain. He tells them that they both need to do it until they get used to it and gain fire resistance skills, especially if they don't want to repeat the tragedy of the fifth floor. Remembering the past, Aaron musters the courage and starts bringing his hand towards the brazier. However, Han stops him and tells him to do it when no one is watching because he doesn't have a habit of watching people scream. Jenna still doesn't want to do it, so Han grabs her hand and offers to do it for her. While Jenna screams, he tells her that they need to protect their incompetent mage or else she will die, which could become the reason for them not surviving the tenth floor. Jenna finally understands while Han tells Aaron he has another thing he needs him to do. He takes out his dagger and stabs his hand, giving Aaron an example of how he can get a pain resistance skill. Aaron is visibly shaken, but Han knows that he needs this because although health potions can heal injuries, they still cause extreme pain in return. Jenna is relieved to hear that she doesn't have to do this, but Han tells her she will also need to in the future. For now, he tells her she will learn switching skill so she can quickly switch between her daggers and bow. He further explains that they will be using a triangular formation from now on with Eloka in the middle, so they need Jenna as well because he and Aaron aren't sufficient for completely protecting the princess. After this, Han returns to his room. He assumes that Party 2 will be taking the ninth floor. However, he knows that as long as the chain quest is active, both parties will be needed because the tenth floor requires at least two parties. Knowing the dangers ahead, Han lights the brazier and begins his fire resistance training, getting the skill soon after. The next day, Han tells Yolka that she needs to make her spells more efficient as she is useless right now. This enrages her, but she follows Han's instructions and storms off to train. She uses class 3 fire magic, which includes ignition, explosion, and fire modification. Despite her power, she needs better control over it. Han starts his training with Jenna, which involves him deflecting arrows. By discarding his shield, he obtains projectile defense and levels up his beginner sword skill to level 6. Meanwhile, Jenna continues training herself and switching as she continuously attacks Han. As always, he finds Jenna's growth rate abnormally good for a 1 star and is impressed by it. On the other hand, Aaron is pretty normal for a 1 star with only basic spearmanship at level 3. Aaron spends his time training pain resistance, while Ilka practices her magic in the magic hall. Other one stars come to train, but they are mostly useless, and the master doesn't seem to be planning any more gacha pulls. The next day, Edis's party returns after clearing the ninth floor, and they don't seem to be in very good condition. Han inquires about the mission to get some clues. Edis tells him they had to subjugate a goblin village with about 50 goblins. However, the issue was the terrain, which was muddy due to rainwater. After Edis's party, Han's party goes in, clearing the floor easily with Yolka's magic. As they return, Han knows that they have reached their level limit with the current number of floors. They all have gained better equipment with the help of the equipment factory, and the two people they saw at the training grounds have been added to the parties. With the tenth floor ahead, Yesel visits Han, asking him if he has figured out what the tenth floor mission is. He responds that he isn't a god, but Yesel thinks otherwise because he is the master of masters. Though that is true, even Han was only able to get to floor 88, but that was achieved with many failures and losses. Though failures are important for a master to learn anything, Han has not experienced that yet, meaning the first failure could be Han's death. The next day, he gathers everyone at the plaza as he is already aware of what to expect today. Considering the master hasn't done anything since logging in, it means he is contemplating whether to challenge the 10th floor or not. Although Han would have preferred one more week to upgrade all his skills, he already knows the master's pattern as this is just a game for him.
As the rift opens, Han tells the newbie to hide when the fight begins as he is not strong enough for this. The master is given the guidelines about needing two parties and is informed about the tactical station for this important mission. However, Han knows that the master can't use it as it is a complicated system. With that said, he tells Yesel to inform the master about the consumables that were secretly made by him before. As he gives half of the potions to Edis's party, he jokingly asks Edis if they are prepared. He also tells her to meet them in the middle, if the parties are spawned in separate locations. Yesel, being Han's biggest fan, tells everyone not to get in his way. Han tells her there is no need for that as he will climb the tower. Finally, they enter the rift and arrive at the tenth floor. The first thing they see is a man cowering in fear. Han kicks him, but it seems like he can't see them. Everyone is in a panic around them, but Han finds the city very familiar. Aaron also thinks the same but finds it to be a bit different somehow. This reminds Han that it's the same ruined city they were in on the fifth floor, but it hasn't been destroyed yet. Without panicking, Han tells everyone that the mission hasn't started yet, so they need to scout the area and return within five minutes. He goes to the watchtower to get a better look where he notices the morale of the soldiers is already at rock bottom. To the north forest, there are 2,213 goblins, while to the east, where the river is, there are only 899. Moreover, the soldiers gathered outside the castle are only 353, which isn't very reassuring. However, Han theorizes that if it's a survival mission, it would be very easy as they can use the NPCs as bait, and can even use Eolka's area spells for defense. As he is deep in thought, the second party arrives. Suddenly, he is shaken by seeing a three-part warning sign signifying the highest difficulty. Their mission is to defend the city from destruction. This is the worst-case scenario as they only have 360 people, including the soldiers, while there are thousands of goblins. Without wasting any time, Han asks them to share their findings. Jenna found out that they can touch the NPCs, but they can't hear or see them. Aaron discovered that there are only two gates, north and east, which are going to be attacked by goblins soon, and there is no escape. Edis asks what they need to do, to which Han responds that they need to defend the city. Roderick proposes they leave and launch a guerrilla attack. However, Han points to the glowing twin goddess statue, telling everyone that if that gets destroyed, they will fail the mission. Roderick finds it absurd, but Han informs everyone that if they fail, they will all die regardless of where they are. Despite the ridiculous mission, Han knows that there is always a strategy. With that in mind, he tells them to be careful of the ladder cart, which only the goblin army to the north possesses. So he tells Edis's party to help in the north and destroy the ladder. She expresses that even if they destroy the ladder and hold the goblins, they still can't win. Han is already aware that the goblins won't retreat as they destroyed the city on the fifth floor. However, he knows that there must be a clue at the river in the east, which was flooded due to the collapse of a dam. Hearing all this, Jenna remembers she heard the sound of horses galloping beyond the river. With this information, Han is able to put the pieces together. Firstly, he punishes Jenna for not mentioning this sooner. With that out of the way, he tells Edis to hold out until they return no matter what they have to do. Edis, being smart, already understands the plan and assures him that they will do their best. Meanwhile, Jenna, not understanding, finds the plan to be sloppy. Aaron also thinks it's too dangerous to go outside the walls, but Han tells him it's necessary, otherwise, they will just get eliminated. If what Jenna heard is correct, they need to kill the goblins and protect the dam so reinforcements can come. This means they need to annihilate the goblins to win. Running through the crowd, Han and the party reach the outer gate. He tells Jenna to scout from above the wall while Aaron opens the door, and Ilka uses magic immediately after. He doesn't give the newbie any orders. As soon as Aaron starts opening the gate, the soldiers try to interfere, thinking that it's an evil spirit. Han and Jenna stop them while Ilka starts casting. The gate opens a little, and the goblins begin their attack, but Han and Jenna keep them at bay. Suddenly, it starts to rain, but that does not affect a mage's spells. Soon after, the gates are open, and the goblins rush in, going straight for Iolka. With her class 2 magic, she burns them before they can touch her. Han immediately orders Jenna and Aaron to charge while he gives Iolka a mana potion. He asks her if she can handle this as they have only just started, but she is confident. 
However, the newbie is terrified after witnessing everything. Han instructs him to go to Edis, giving him another chance to prove himself. With the gates closing behind them, Han knows they can only go forward from here as there is no more escape. He tells everyone to take their positions while ordering Wolka to prepare a class 1 fire spell. The rain gets heavier and the goblins attack. With only 20 seconds left until Wolka fires again, they all fight to keep her safe. The goblins target her, but once again she fires, blowing them away. As everyone runs through, they can feel the heat, but it's bearable due to their training. However, the rain is no blessing as it is causing the fire to be extinguished. Thus, Ilka has to continuously cast to maintain their fire barricade. With another spell, they once again have to keep her safe for 20 more seconds. While taking cover in the fire, everyone slowly moves forward. They have to repeat this until they get to the river, but everyone is exhausted, and there is no end to this army of goblins. A giant goblin leads the army, but Han is unaware of him. He is busy dealing with the goblins who suddenly start to charge through the fire. As Han deals with them, he notices it's because of their leader, who has figured out that there is a delay between Yolka's casting. Realizing his plan won't work anymore, and everyone is slowly declining into exhaustion, he gathers everyone, telling them they need to get rid of their leader and they only have one chance. Han takes care of the goblins as they get through the fire barricade, going straight for Aoka. With her casting done, Han tells her to burn them. It seems like the spell wasn't enough, but Aoka isn't done as the flames explode. While Aaron shields Jenna, she shoots straight at the boss. Meanwhile, exhausted Yolka falls right into Han's arms. He knows that the goblins' true goal is to take down the city while they are just obstacles. He wonders if they will still go for them, now that their commander is gone. Fortunately, they go for the fortress, allowing the party to finally reach the river. As they rest, Han tells everyone to heal up using the health potions. He wonders how Edis's party is doing at the North Wall, but doesn't seem to have time for that as more goblins approach the dam. They haven't even properly rested, and it doesn't seem like they will be able to, as the goblins have brought a big new friend with them. Han quickly assigns everyone their roles. Ilka is to create a firewall while Aaron protects her. Meanwhile, Han gets ready to take on the oversized pig. However, it's easier said than done, as the ogre is capable of crushing him in a single hit. Seeing that the only way to defeat him is to slowly chip away at him, he begins. As he strikes from up close, Jenna supports him with her bow from afar. They are both slowly able to damage the ogre. Although they already have their hands full, Jenna spots another one coming from behind, shocking Han. He knows the longer it goes on, the more disadvantages they will have, so he rushes in, ignoring the damage and the pain. He finds that the ogre is male as he hits him between the legs. The pig isn't happy about this and tries to attack, but it's no use as Han uses the ogre's body to climb and stab his sword in the neck. It doesn't go deep so he immediately uses his shield as a hammer to nail it down, taking out one of them. Setting his eye on the next one, he tells Jenna to lure it away from Yulka. The distraction doesn't work and now it's too late as he is about to hit her. However, the ogre goes right past her. Han immediately realizes that the ogre is there to destroy the dam and screams Jenna's name. Reacting instantly, she jumps on top of him and stabs him in the neck. With the ogre slowed down, Han rushes in with madness in his eyes and strikes him down. As it drops into the river, Han feels relieved, but the ogre is shockingly still alive. The monster destroys the dam, causing the water to get through. Having dealt with the goblins, Aaron shouts what they should do now. However, Han stands there quietly staring at the broken dam. Unable to think clearly, he also wonders what they should do. As Aaron puts his hand on Han's shoulder, he finally comes to his senses. He tells him they need to head back and come up with a second plan, although he himself isn't sure what that could be. Suddenly, Yolka tells them to wait as she starts casting a new spell. Han looks in shock as she lifts a boulder and seals the dam. As the shock wears off, he pulls Iolka's cheek for hiding her best skill. Despite that, he thanks her as they couldn't have done it without her. Even in this situation, the goblins don't plan on letting them rest. Once again, everyone starts to fend them off with everything they have. For a second, Han is worried about what if there is no support. However, they don't have time for that, so he asks Iolka to drink all the potions and use level 2 magic. 
Before she can even begin casting, she is jumped by the goblins. In the nick of time, she is saved by a man on a horse, who stops right in front of Han. After a few seconds, the man shouts for the Iron Lion cavalry to charge. As the horses run through the field, a notification pops up about them. Although they are around 500 in number, these soldiers are much stronger as they easily plunder the goblins in their path. Everyone is relieved, thinking their job is done, but Han tells them otherwise as he asks if they know how to ride horses. As he himself doesn't know, he requests the master for a horse riding skill book. The skill books are part of the battle item shop. Though they can't teach skills directly related to battle, they can help with other basic ones. With Han having just learned horse riding and Jenna already being adept at it, they both take a horse. Han knows that they have a chance now, but they need to take action. So they head to the main battlefield with the army. Han knows that with numbers on their side, it's time to retaliate. Riding his horse, he decides to head toward the north gate, flanked by ladder carts. The cavalry, aware of this, is also headed there. If he can follow them, the mission will be a success, but he knows the game won't let it end so easily. Annoyed by the shitty game, he shouts, telling his party members that they are diverting and will head away from the battlefield. Aaron, being confused, questions his decision. Han reveals that this isn't the entire goblin army, they are moving out of arrow range and into the northern forest. As they reach the forest, the rain stops just in time. Han spots the goblin riders lying in the ambush, and he plans to disrupt them using Yolka's magic. Aaron now understands the situation. Han asks Yolka about her magic reserves. She responds that she can do it, but the power will be weak. Han instructs her to focus on effectiveness. He plans to move through the forest as Yolka sets it ablaze with her magic, Meanwhile, on Edis's side, Dickhead is fighting a goblin and stabs it with all his strength. However, the goblin grabs his leg before falling. Just as Dickhead is about to fall, Edis saves him, swiftly finishing off the goblin with a strike that sends blood sputtering into the air. She tells him not to worry about it and to keep fighting. Just then, she notices that the cavalry soldiers have arrived and are charging at the enemy. Pleased that Han succeeded, she continues slashing through the goblins, motivating her team with the victory in sight. As Iolka's magic reaches its breaking point, the forest starts to go up in flames. In the chaos that follows, many soldiers and a handful of civilians meet their unfortunate demise. Despite the odds, the battle rages on with the surviving goblin riders. Han convinces himself that torching the forest was a smart move in preventing total annihilation. Thankfully, the cavalry proved to be too much for the goblins, securing victory in the end. Cheers of relief fill the air as everyone realizes they've made it out alive. Han and his crew return unscathed, only to be met with Jenna's rational observation. If the mission is complete, why aren't they heading back home? Suddenly, a wave of dread washes over Han as he realizes that they've eliminated all the monsters, yet the call to retreat is strangely absent. Before he can react, error messages start popping up, signaling a glitch in the system. Time stops and Han is left alone, frozen in disbelief when a mysterious voice startles him by beckoning him to turn around. Upon seeing the dark, level 999 mysterious figure, Han's blood boils as he remembers encountering the same glitch when he accidentally ended up in Pick Me Up. He can't help but lash out in frustration and yell at the pesky bug. He recaps his party of six star members who were the first to conquer the 88th floor and reach S rank in the game. Pick Me Up is all about the luck of the draw when it comes to gachas, skills, and battles. He can provide some basic guidance, but the heroes ultimately rely on their unique skills and tactics to prevail. At times, they find themselves mysteriously incapable of fighting. If this were a game where rank and luck were top priority, Han wouldn't have made it as far as he has. What hooked him is the ability for skills to outshine sheer luck. As Han catches a glimpse of the shadowy figure, He's dumbfounded to spot a level 999, way beyond the max capacity of 99. Anger bubbles up in him, until he spies a level 15 cloaked character named Dark Disciple ominously standing beside the shadowy figure. With a chilling grin, Dark Disciple taunts, I'll wait for you, and with a poof, they both vanish into thin air. The restoration concludes, and the servers reconnect. Jenna is concerned about Han, but he shouts and instructs her to rush into the castle. Aaron, equally confused, asks Han what's going on. 
It crosses his mind that the Dark Disciple is a creature known only to the upper floor and never reported to be on lower levels. As he's about to divulge its traits, a soldier screams as he gets attacked by a giant, weird-looking monster. Han instructs everyone to continue moving towards where they first arrived, ignoring the rest. A notification announces the resurrection of more than 2,436 living corpses. Han grits his teeth, knowing about the living corpses made from corpses meeting certain conditions. They can be finished by destroying their skulls. Reaching the castle's gate, they open it and everyone enters. Han drops Iolka, asking Jenna to protect the goddess statue with Edis. He instructs them to lock the gates until he returns. Though they seem worried, Han urges Aaron to get a grip if he wants to survive. They all resolve to return alive as Han leaves, promising to come back. With a blue glint in his eyes, he decides to finish off the disgusting creatures one by one. A single strike is all he needs. The mutated wolves also return, causing him to worry. However, he observes Jenna shooting arrows, realizing the gates won't hold for long. Han makes his way toward the forest where he believes the disciple awaits. He swiftly dispatches enemies along the way with single strikes, resolute in his determination to kill the Dark Disciple. Han reflects on the two ways these beasts can act. They can destroy the statue of the goddess or choose to act on their desire to consume flesh. The stronger ones are more annoying, so Han has come up with a random pattern to screw the raiders over, annihilating them with a single strike to the head. He wishes that he had two bodies. He notices Edis's leadership despite the dire situation. He knows the priority is to protect the goddess statue. He believes in Aaron's and Jenna's skills from the fifth floor, making them capable of defending the statue even if the outer defense fails. Some NPCs beg to be let in the gates as they have nowhere to go. As Han heads past the fire, he concludes that he needs to kill the Dark Disciple as it's what matters most. Han's flame resistance skill levels up to two. As he strolls amid the burning forest, he gets to the regional boundary of them. He consumes a potion before calling out to the Dark Disciple. Notifications pop up one after the other about stats being reduced due to fear, and Edis's HP is reduced as she gets inflicted with bleeding. Just then, a shadow hurls toward Han, a lightning pace, but he blocks it with his shield in the nick of time. However, it pierces through the shield, injuring Han's shoulder and causing it to bleed. He contemplates that the Dark Disciple should only appear on the middle floors, but as he's appeared on the lower floor, he's relatively strong. Just then, three shadow-like arrows hurl toward him, and he's able to strike them this time, but one gets past his defense and Han bleeds once again as he gets pierced by the arrow. While panting, he's glad for his defense skill, otherwise, he would have died. He keeps inhaling the fumes, and if he passes out, it will be the end for their party. Just then, a voice declares the intention to talk to Han. He asks what the talk is about, and the voice declares that Han is different from them and once again strikes at a fast speed. But Han deflects the shadowy arrows with his dagger and enters the berserk state. With a red hue and a menacing aura, he deflects the attack continuously, and his face looks as if one eye is engulfed by the shadow. With gritted teeth, he strikes the disciple who has been casting the shadowy arrows. As the Disciple's attack strikes Han's body once more, he screams in pain but heads toward the Disciple, finishing him with a single bold strike. While panting, he ponders about the stage clear message that is nowhere to be seen. With a wounded face, he knows that if it's not over, then it's the end for them, as he'll probably die before the Goddess statue falls. A notification about another member's death prompts him to ponder that his death will be meaningless as he will die after all his hard work. As he is given up, all the other party members, those on the verge of their limit, come into view one after the other. Just then, the stage clears and Han, Jenna, Roderick, Usher, Aaron, and Deka level up. There's a hero among the master's heroes awaiting promotion. The coming promotion stone will unlock a hidden piece of memory along with an adventure dungeon, and the lobby's name will be changed to Taunia. Han wakes up in his room, relieved to be alive. He heads to the dining hall and notices Aaron sitting there with a long face. Startled, Aaron mentions how everyone was worried about Han. In response, Han asks Aaron what he's so worried about. Aaron reveals that he's been contemplating the reason they fight. He recalls the monster flooding the city after Han left, and he notices Aaron's rising stress level. As Aaron gets up to leave, Han sarcastically asks if he'll return with the same long face tomorrow. With a smile, 
Aaron assures him that he'll be his usual self. Inside, Han finds a table full of delicious breakfast foods. Jenna is surprised by the feast and Chloe explains that Han requested the best meal they could prepare. He asks Jenna if she doesn't like it, and she assures him she loves it and that a meal like this is always welcome. He observes that Jenna, Aaron, and Ulka are doing well, but Dika still needs time to manage his stress. The system welcomes Han, informing him that a hero is ready for ranking up. Han is directed to the promotion center, an accessory building of the merging center, to complete the rank up. Han approves its construction, and once the promotion center is complete, he can now rank up heroes. The synthesis process involves a low-ranking Firestone, Waterstone, and Windstone, resulting in a low-ranking Promotion Stone with an 87% success rate. After Han confirms the merge, Yesel presents him with the low-rank Promotion Stone and congratulates him on ranking up. She assures him that with this, he will soon be a 7-star hero. Han is skeptical, doubting his ability to reach 7 stars and suspecting some hidden condition. The system announces the promotion will start now. The promotion center opens its doors, and Han enters, anticipating a rank up to a two-star hero. He wonders if the door leads to the second floor. Inside the promotion center, Han notes it is an area unseen by the master. He places the low-rank promotion stone in the magic circle, which begins to glow. Suddenly, Han finds himself in a different location. He sees a woman holding a baby and questions who they are. Realizing the baby isn't him, Han understands it must be Han Yizel, the rightful occupant. He decides to focus on the task and notices the waiting room lacks facilities, indicating it is not whatever's waiting room. A rift opens and Yizel emerges, smaller than her and seemingly unable to speak. She gestures toward the rift, indicating Han should enter. He discovers it leads to a transcendental dungeon with extreme difficulty. As the dungeon opens, he feels overwhelming pressure and fear. The system warns that his stats have decreased by 30% due to fear. Unable to manage the pressure, Han enters Berserk mode and prepares to face a level 999 monster. The monster, familiar from his past, greets Han, who questions its presence. Acknowledging his chances are slim, Han recalls the figure defeated Dyer's party of high-level heroes in seconds. The monster inquires if Han is feeling aggressive, hinting that he might be holding a grudge. Han fires back demanding the monster to zip it or teleport him out of there. It applauds Han for keeping his cool and unveils that this enchanted realm is specifically for Han. Suddenly, the creature morphs into a girl, declaring that this unexpected encounter was all for the renowned ranker of Pick Me Up. Han skeptically probes her true identity. He realizes that, for some reason, she looks like Gessel. She doesn't know how to introduce herself, and Han thinks it's like seeing an older version of Yesel. He tells her that she doesn't need to introduce herself. He'll just think of her as a bitch. The girl starts giggling and says that won't do. She guesses he thought she looked like Yesel and tells him that it's actually the opposite. Yesel is the one who looks like her. She reveals that Yesel is simply a replica of her, the 100,479th copy, matching the number of downloads for Pick Me Up. She glances at a card in her hand, and Han questions if she's messing with him. The girl explains that she has countless aliases, picking and choosing which to use depending on the situation. She calls Han rude, and he asks if she's the one who brought him here. Han grows angrier as he realizes she really is the one. The girl with a cold expression tells him not to hate her so much. It was unexpected for her too, just an accident. Han dismisses her reasons and demands to be sent back, threatening to kill her if she refuses. Though visibly angry, the girl coldly remarks that it's far-fetched for a mere one star to be threatening her. Han confidently retorts that it'll be a different story soon, and the girl decides it's wiser to end him now before he gets stronger. She attacks Han with a magic spear, striking his heart, but it does no damage. She praises his courage for not flinching, and Han demands to know what she really wants. Realizing she had multiple chances to kill him but didn't, Han concludes she has another motive. The girl admits she simply wanted to talk. She calls him Loki, the undefeated master ranked fifth globally, and confesses she's a fan. She marvels at his gameplay, especially in Niflheim, and shares that he's number one on the headquarters watch list. How could she neglect him? She came to tell him the truth about this world. 
She asks Han what he thinks of the mobile game storyline, explaining that in gacha games, players often overlook the story in favor of content. For her, the storyline is tiring with not much world building, and most masters are unaware of it later in the game. She asks if Han can guess where they are and reveals a location. Though Han says he doesn't care, the girl continues, introducing the city as Nelson on the Heim Peninsula in the Towner Continent, where they met on Floor 10. But now it's destroyed, as he can see. She shares pictures of various ruined cities, explaining that this is the state of every region in Tonner. She asks if Han thinks Niflheim will be any different, revealing that over 100 million worlds in Mobius have fallen similarly. The book's ending was predetermined, a bad ending where everything is destroyed and the characters hope to change it. The solution is simple. Bring in someone from outside the book and rewrite the story, even if the message, background, and continuity are torn apart. She explains that a being from a higher dimension can twist fate just by observing, which is why Pick Me Up was created. She calls him Master Loki, and he smiles, curious about her grand story. He asks why she's telling him this, and she requests his cooperation. Han, not understanding her intentions, attacks her, dismissing her words as crap. She urges him to think carefully, asking for a yes or no, but Han calls her trash for summoning him and causing him hardship. He refuses to cooperate, daring her to kill him now since he at least managed to shove a knife into her skull. The girl, unfazed, drops the dagger from her skull and remarks that his foul mouth hurts her feelings. Han realizes he can't kill her now as he's just a one-star at level 10 and knows he needs to get stronger first. He refuses to talk further and demands to be sent back. She, disappointed, says she expended great power to summon him, holding him in higher regard than anyone else and pick me up. Even those ranked higher than him are mere fireflies compared to him. She asks if he knows why, revealing that it's because he achieved something no other master has. The system shows a message, Master, believe in your bond with your heroes. She asks if he recognizes it, and Han confirms it's from the guide after clearing the tutorial. She tells him he's the only one out of 100 million masters to embody its true meaning. The surroundings transform, and she asks if Han knows where they are. She reveals it's the 80th stage of Niflheim, a place he mastered six months ago, with only five out of 100 million players having conquered it. Han recognizes the ordeal of the 80th floor and asks why she's showing him this. She replies simply that she wants him to watch everything with her, summoning another chair and inviting him to sit, as it's going to be a long, uncomfortable journey. She asks him how it feels to experience this in person, rather than through a screen. To her, it's magnificent. The 80th floor is the first conquest-type floor, offering no clear instructions or difficulty level, which is random and depends on luck. Every ranker who reached the 80th floor failed miserably, as it was considered an insurmountable wall. Han was no different, but he recalls how he cleared it and wonders why she's showing him a replay. She responds there's no particular reason and tells him to wait and see. After clearing the 79th floor, Han confidently moved on to the 80th, but most of his heroes, except his main party, were wiped out in an agonizing battle. The 80th floor is hell an extreme environment where nothing can survive. The system displays fragments of chaos, despair, and resentment, monsters that turn the 80th floor into a living hell. She notices he recognizes them and mentions that the difficulty varies from account to account, as does the summoning success rate. She questions if he thinks it's a coincidence that he never picked a natural five-star hero. She reveals it wasn't due to bad luck. There simply were no heroes left in Niflheim. It is an S-ranked account, the worst in every way. She's still amazed he reached the 88th floor. Han relaxes, drinking lemon juice while watching the 80th floor. The strongest heroes in Niflheim gather to face the monsters. As the monsters charge, the system activates the command post, allowing him to issue orders through the tactic screen. She finds his strategies on the 80th floor fascinating. Despite the complex process, the goal is simple, conquer the enemy. She advises him to observe closely how the heroes behave, as this defines his exceptional leadership. The heroes, knowing the plan is flawless, vow not to fail their king. The system warns the limit ends in 10 seconds. As the notification appears, the heroes step forward to introduce themselves. King's Arrow, Neheku Gastel. King's Spear, Mutant Nidelk. King's Sword, Litigen. 
King's eyes, Uranethsid, and King's flames, Cirrus Adjathheim. With their introductions complete, the mission begins. As the monsters attack, they fight fiercely for their king. Yessel notes their sincere loyalty, remarking that six star heroes are the strongest across all servers, unmatched except by seven stars. She acknowledges Loki has nurtured fearsome heroes, emphasizing that what truly matters is how they view their master. As heroes climb the tower and rank up, they realize the harsh truth. No one pledges loyalty to a master who treats them as mere toys. She smirks, calling him different, the only master who truly ruled over the waiting room. She recognizes him as Loki, the king of Niflheim, and reveals that even now, his heroes are desperately searching for him. No other heroes would search every universe for their master. She observes that his play style is unique as he never merges his heroes. Most masters control their heroes by synthesizing them, discarding the obedient or worthless. Han, however, rarely merged heroes, preferring to keep those with potential. Han recalls never summoning a natural five-star hero, with Cirrus being the only four-star hero he managed to summon. Others thought his account was cursed, urging him to quit, but he persevered, accustomed to the world's injustices. Yessel thinks back to how other masters would tour with their heroes and discard them when bored, treating them like commodities. Even low-ranking heroes with potential weren't thrown out by Han, as he believed ruling through fear only led to collapse. He was someone who rewarded heroes who proved their worth and punished those who didn't all while understanding that the heroes were actually human. Yessel with a smirk reveals that she doesn't know how he found out, but her conclusion makes sense. The heroes were strikingly realistic for programmed characters, each responding uniquely to the same command. Han, however, viewed them as mere tools and focuses on efficiency. He questions if it's the reason she liked him, Yessel explains that she has always wanted to converse with him, lamenting that they never had the chance on Earth. Han agrees, his eyes cold and sharp, adding that if they had met on Earth, she would have been six feet under within minutes. He expresses his deep resentment, expressing that he will remember how much she aggravated him. He makes it clear that neither Taunia nor Niflheim has any relevance to him, emphasizing that he is from Earth and rejecting her attempts to impose her agenda on him. The girl laughs, suggesting that the heroes in Niflheim will be disappointed by her master's dismissal. Han is indifferent to their opinions. He notes that if her only goal is to reach the top of the tower, she wouldn't need him, as the Niflheim party is already progressing well, nearing the 90th floor with minimal casualties. He indicates that he will not cooperate with her and demands she leave before he loses his patience. The girl claims he could have been the savior of Mobius, but insists he must climb to her position first. After that, she promises to overlook his insolence. Han inquires if the black priest's appearance on the floor is due to her. She assures him that she intends to interfere starting from floor 15, as Taunio will provide an exciting welcome. Smiling deviously, she mentions that the difficulty is S-grade, like Niflheim, and that the odds of his master quitting are over 90% unless she helps. She vows that if he clears the tower, she will send him back to his world and give him half of her Mobius share, making him a major shareholder of a world-class corporation. She asks if they have a deal, but Han tells her to stay away. He doubts her promises, believing them to be empty words, and is determined to conquer the tower on his own. Realizing Han's deep hatred, Yissel is struck in the head by him. Han thinks that climbing higher will reveal more information and resolves to rely only on himself. She laughs, telling him that he won't reach the top without some determination. Deciding to forgive him, she reveals the true prologue of Pick Me Up, a preparation for his tower climb. The door opens, bathing the room in purple light, and a land of harmonious coexistence is revealed. This land, Taunia, has been ravaged by an unknown enemy and the power of darkness. She questions why Pick Me Up is so difficult, explaining it is like fighting a battle that has already been lost. She urges him to reverse fate, addressing him as Loki. The system announces that there is still hope and that Han can save the world by conquering the tower. Countless heroes will support him if he believes in their bond. The future of the world depends on Han. Yissel reminds him that Taunia's fate rests on him and his master, questioning if he can achieve the unprecedented feat of climbing the tower. Han dismisses her warnings as nonsense but is told to climb anyway. The system congratulates Han as his forgotten memories resurface and he reaches two-star status. He questions if this is the end, 
and the system confirms that his level and skill limits have increased. Aaron sees Han and realizes he has returned. He asks what Han has been doing alone, and Han mentions a promotion which he will soon experience. Aaron reassures him that everything is as usual. Han thinks of his sister Nina, realizing she is the reason Aaron needs to return home. His objective remains unchanged, to climb the tower and return to Earth. Han feels worse than before but is determined to repay his debt to whoever it was. The next day the system apologizes for the server error, explaining it was caused by an unfortunate disconnection a few days ago. Han remembers that the masters on the lower floors were disconnected and the company attributed it to a sudden server outage. He realizes it was due to the figure that appeared right before they cleared floor 10. The system offers compensation, including benefits for the masters. Yissel congratulates Loki on his promotion and notices his bad mood. She asks what happened and Han tells her he met her original. Confused, she learns he met the co-CEO of Mobius. Yessel is shocked and asks how much he heard, but Han dismisses the new information, saying nothing changes. He shares his goal of climbing the tower and requests her help. She agrees and presents a golden ticket, asking if he knows what it is. She explains it's a gift ticket that can be used to buy anything. Han asks if she's giving it to him, and she clarifies it's from the master, acknowledging Loki's greatness. Han considers giving out gifts as rewards and knows he must fake gold depending on the gift's value with higher ranked gifts requiring gems. Normally, people have to pay, but a gift ticket allows for free items. He notes it's a gift up to 10,000 gold and realizes the master holds him in high regard. He decides to return the ticket, saying he doesn't need it. Yesel is shocked, but he tells her to give it to someone else. She asks if he's sure, as it could buy valuable items, but Han says nothing decent is available for 10,000 gold. He questions why she's following him and says he's going to bed. Yesel purchases a warhorse sculpture with the ticket. The system notes that gifting a favorite hero can increase affinity. Han questions the sculpture's purpose, and Yesel explains it's a gift from the master. Han throws it away, saying the master should have rewarded everyone, not just one hero. He believes part of being a good master is knowing how and when to reward heroes, as each has different tastes. He smiles, thinking he knows his top hundred heroes well, and questions Watvar's thoughts. A rift in space and time opens. Han realizes that his level or rank isn't the issue, the biggest problem is the enemies within. He thinks the enemy is the master, who might be a novice, calling it ridiculous. Aulka's stress maxes out attributed to repetitive training and the events on the 10th floor. A decent master would have prioritized their heroes. Yolka asks for their next destination, and Han says taking on the 11th floor in this state would be nonsense, suggesting floor 8 or 9 instead. Whatever hasn't grasped the essence of pick me up, Han looks at the floor level and sees it's an 11-story dungeon. He questions if they have I'm so good syndrome where players believe they cleared a dungeon due to their own skills, though they actually relied on their heroes. Normally, players must recognize their heroes on lower floors before advancing, but being sent directly to floor 11 indicates a delusion of skill. The system announces that this floor's conquest goal is to annihilate the enemy, highlighting the delusion of player skill. Han questions if he can really carry such a jerk to the top.